Good evening. In this uh, video, we're going to examine who Dr. Catherine Pulaski is and try to pin down some of her less than stellar attitudes, let's say, uh, as seen in Star Trek TNG. And this is a bit of a tongue in cheek, so hopefully uh, we'll have a little fun with this. So this video is covered under f fair use, uh, which is allowed for the purposes of criticism, news reporting, teaching, and parody, which doesn't infringe on copyright under 17 USC 107. So who is Dr. Catherine Pulaski? This is an origin theory of who she is, why she might have some of her attitudes that are, mm, let's call them prejudiced. She's a little bit prejudiced, at least at the beginning of her um, being chief medical officer on board the USS Enterprise. Now, what do we know about her? Well, we know that she's an accomplished physician. She is an accomplished surgeon. She believes in natural medicine. She... Uh, has had a paper published on propagation of viruses. She is very honest, very almost to the point of being brusque. And she participated in a small way in the rescue of Kyle Riker, who is William Riker's dad, uh, after a Tholian attack on a star base. So this is what we know about her. We also know that she served aboard the Repulse before this and that her captain, Captain Taggart, would have given her a shuttle because she doesn't like the transporter. He would have given her a shuttle if she had remained on, on the Repulse. So she's that good of a doctor. But she's got a couple of hang-ups. And... One of her hang-ups is data. Well, first of all, this is uh, in the opening season opener, uh, The Child, where Deanna is pregnant, and they're looking at some things uh, on Deanna's pregnancy, and she calls him Data. She says, Data, come look at this. And he's like, Data. And she's like, what? And he's like, data. And she's like, what's the difference? He's like, one of them is my name and one of them isn't. And she's like, okay, whatever. Um, but she does correct herself. Clearly she does. She's, you know, she's, not, she's not completely prejudiced against data. She just has this sort of... Ins this uh, sort of... Um, uh, less than a stellar attitude towards him. She treats him like an object early in one, uh, like a toaster. And by a toaster, I mean asylum. No, I don't. I, uh, wrong franchise, sorry. Uh, no, I mean that she treats him like an object. And so, of course, she corrects herself. She calls him Data. Sorry, sorry, Data. It's Data, I understand. But then she immediately turns around and she performs an invasive medical scan on data without his consent. Now, anybody else, you're going to have to get their consent. But she's looking for this magic algorithm that gives him the imitation of hurt feelings because she's just marveling at the technology of data. She's not treating data like a person at all, right? So she's a little bit insensitive towards his feelings. Feelings being relative in this term. Not only is she insensitive here, but later on when Deanna actually comes into sick bay and she is ready to have the baby, Data offers to hold her hand. And Pulaski basically insults him saying, Deanna needs the warmth of human touch, not the cold hand of technology. And Deanna says, 
no, data will do just fine. Thank you very much. Gently putting P P Pulaski in her place. Later on in the episode where silence has lease, they're lost in a hole in space, which apparently they have no idea about holes in space, have never seen it before. Of course, that's ridiculous because that happened in TOS as well. Um, but the hole in space looks like something. It looks like this bluish kind of black cloud and she's trying to get data to zoom in to see further and she keeps ordering him to zoom in zoom in zoom in and he's doing it and she turns around and she says does it know how to do these things well two problems with that right first problem obvious she calls data it his preferred pronoun obviously is him Second problem with that is she's calling into question his ability as a bridge officer when he's clearly a lieutenant commander on the bridge of the Enterprise. And Picard rightly puts her in her place again. He says, yes, she, he is fully qualified. He knows what he's doing. You don't have to question everything that he does. So, again, she's just being... She's treating him like an object. She's not treating him like a person. She, again, apologizes to Data, but her apology is somewhat um, insincere in that she says, Oh, Mr. Data, I'm sorry. Starfleet classifies you as a, as a sentient being. I have, to, I have to respect their wishes, not his wishes, not his, not his identity. They, she has to respect Starfleet's mandate that he's uh, that he's a sentient being. Uh, that's not the same thing as apologizing directly to Data, right? It just isn't. So maybe she has a problem with. So you know, we know she has a problem with transporters too, because Captain Taggart would have kept her, would have given her a shuttle if she had stayed on board the Repulse, because she's just that good of a doctor. So maybe she has a problem with advanced technology, right? Because data is advanced technology, maybe that's where her problem comes from. But I don't think so. We'll get into that um, more later. Then, she doesn't have any problems with advanced genetic engineered humans, right? She actually is overjoyed here. She is meeting a genetically engineered 12-year-old boy who in stature is 17 years old because obviously he's played by a 17 or 18-year-old. Um, and he's a true telepath. And there's, prob and there's a reason why she's overjoyed to be meeting a true telepath that I will get into as well. And it has nothing to do with her disliking advanced technology necessarily. It has nothing to do with the fact that she would prefer humans be advanced, not, not tech. Um, it, and it has more to do with her potential family history her potential lineage. But moving on from that, we also see, and most people don't see, don't see this, I don't think, but she's kind of a jerk to Jordy. Jordy comes in, in the episode, loud as a whisper, he comes into, he comes into sick bay to ask Dr. Pulaski, if there's something that can be modified about his visor so that it is less painful to him, okay? That's the topic of conversation that he wants to have. She, on the other hand, changes that entire topic of conversation to, well, I have two options I can offer you. Number one, ocular implants. 
ocular implants look more like human eyes. They're still sensor devices, but they look like human eyes. The downside to that is they're not as sensitive as his visor. Second option she offers him is she's done it twice before. She can regenerate the optic nerve. She can at least try and give him replicated human eyes, real human eyes, so he could see just like everybody else, right? So uh, these are the two options that she gives him. She says it's not, she's not offering any guarantees. She's only offering options. And the human eye thing, it's a one-shot deal. If you go that route, it can't be undone. So if it fails somehow, they can't fix him up so that he can see with his visor again, apparently. So not only does she not bring up, not only does she not address what he wants to talk about, she leaves out a third option that as a medical doctor, she should know about. And potentially, she should know about this also because of her potential family lineage. And we'll get into that too. But in the meantime, Jordy is like, okay, Doc, I wasn't thinking along those lines. Let me go off and think about it. And here we see Jordy LaForge leaving sick bay, and she's got this smirk on her face like she just pulled the wool over his eyes, <laughs> metaphorically speaking. Um, like she's just pulled a fast one on this guy, right? And you got to wonder why that is, right? I, I, I certainly wonder why. I wonder why she seems to be prejudiced towards data. I wonder why she seemingly is prejudiced towards Jordy LaForge um, and why she seems to be so happy here as if she's really pulled a fast one, right? And unfortunately for Jordy, because of his hesitation and because he doesn't do away with the visor, he gets kidnapped by the Romulans. So he gets kidnapped by the Romulans because of his visor. They're going to use his optical implants. They successfully use his optical implants to brainwash him into wanting to kill somebody. And if that's not bad enough, he barely manages not to kill this person. Somebody stops him and then he's then he has to go through this whole PTSD thing and has to see Deanna Troy and all this stuff. Not only is it bad enough that he gets captured by the Romulans, but later he gets captured by Soren and the Klingons, Lursa and Bator. And the reason he gets captured by them is because his optical implants, his optical implants will allow the sisters to monitor what he sees in real time and they're looking for the shield frequencies of the Enterprise D. So uh, if she had offered him this third alternative, none of this stuff could have potentially happened, right? And I know by now you're probably wondering what that third alternative is we're getting there please be patient but first we have to talk about why it is that she has these sort of prejudices and where these prejudices might have come from in her life right because she's a good officer we know she's a good officer we know she's a great surgeon right um she saves picard's life she can potentially give Jordy new life, new eyes. Um, she 
can do field medicine where her her medic is like what's a splint oh my god what is that that's so stupid and she's like no it's not stupid it's real medicine it's field medicine and it's honest to goodness the way to go in this situation where they can't do the bone suture laser right so she really knows her stuff So then, where does this attitude come from? Well, let's go back about 100 years. In the original series episode, Return to Tomorrow, we meet Sargon. Sargon is a, an intellect only. He's mental energy, and he's been kept in this crystal ball for over 600,000 years. The Enterprise, the original Enterprise, is led to a dead planet. And the dead planet contains the remains, the mental energy remains of the inhabitants, of some of the inhabitants of this planet who have, in their godlike little g, little, little g, godlike um, powers have released this cataclysm on their civilization and completely destroyed their civilization uh, 600,000 years ago. They barely managed to save the best of both sides. And there's... Sargon is the leader, and he's led the Enterprise to his dead planet for a specific reason. That specific reason being to borrow some bodies. They want to borrow Kirk's body, they want to borrow Spock's body, and they want to borrow one other person's body. Meet Dr. Ann Mall Hall. Dr. Ann Mall Hall is an astrobiologist and she's serving on board the Enterprise. And she has been ordered to report to the transporter room for landing party duty. Well, when Kirk says, well, who ordered you to come to the transporter room for landing party duty? She can't, she can't figure out who it, who it was that ordered her. But she says very brusquely, well, I'm not a liar, Captain. She's very honest, right? She's brutally honest in this case. And this is a trait that Dr. Pulaski has, right? So here you see um, Dr. Ann Mulhall, and she is told to report, and Spunk backs her up because he was also somewhat told to report for landing party duty uh, by Sargon uh, through indirect means. But Spock backs her up, and they go and they beam down to the planet, where it is revealed that the inhabitants, the three remaining inhabitants, Henoch, who is from one side of the conflict, and Sargon and Phalesa, want to inhabit their uh, Spock, Kirk, and Anne Mulhall's body for a short time. And Phalesa happens to be Sargon's wife. The reason they want to occupy their bodies is to build android bodies. The android bodies, they want to build it themselves because they have advanced techniques and technology that the Federation doesn't have. Uh, Scotty says you're going to need some... He, he, he doesn't understand how a drop of... What looks like a drop of jelly can perform all the motor functions of the musculature system and the skeletal system and uh, Dr. Anwell Hall as Falesa says it will and it'll be twice as strong as your body uh, just go with what we're going just do what we're doing and everything will work out okay great so they want to build these android bodies and so that they can walk among the civilizations again 
so that they can teach them and be advisors to them uh, so that they don't commit the same mistakes. But here's the catch. Hanok doesn't want to occupy an android body. And he's hatched a plot to kill Sargon and, by extension, Kirk. Um, and when Felisa finds out, she confronts him. She's like, why are you still working on this thing when you have no intention of occupying it? And he's like, I'm building it for you. To which she responds, I don't like it. I hate it. I don't think I've ever liked the idea of occupying an android body. And the reason she doesn't like it is because they can't feel. There's no sense of touch. As advanced as this thing is, she's not going to be able to feel the wind on her face, the sun on her face. She's not going to be able to touch. She's not going to be able to feel things. Um, and so she hates the idea of occupying this android body. So this is an attitude, again, this attitude is shared with Dr. Pulaski, potentially, right? Not only is this attitude shared with Dr. Pulaski, but photograph, uh, so not only is it shared with Dr. Pulaski, but Hanok has to be destroyed at the end of this whole thing. And Phalesa and Sargon have to destroy themselves too, but they want one last kiss. And so they occupy Kirk and Mulhall one last time. And they have their kiss. And when they leave their and when they leave Kirk and Mulhall's body, Kirk and Mulhall are appropriately embarrassed for having kissed on the bridge and having kissed just having met each other. And some little, a little bit of awkward conversation in the end of the episode, okay? But now, there is more. Photograph Mulhall. Photograph Pulaski. photograph together <laughs> if you know TOS you'll get the joke um, clearly these two except for the age difference are identical they look identical come on Kirk they're identical look at the pictures and here Mulhall and here Pulaski are Identical twins. I mean, look at those eyes, right? They, they just are. So, my theory is that Dr. Mulhall, with her prejudice towards androids, is, in fact, Dr. Pulaski's biological grandmother. And Dr. Pulaski grew up on some of the stories that Dr. Mulhall was telling about her time on the Enterprise, and she kind of in uh, unexpectedly, un subconsciously picked up on some of the attitudes of her grandmother. One of those attitudes being an inherent mistrust or an inherent unlike of androids. So that's the potential there. But there's more. In the episode, in truth, is there no beauty? We get to meet this guy. This guy is Lee Marvick. Lee Marvick is one of the original design engineers for the Enterprise. And he also happens to be in love with another doctor meet Dr. Miranda Jones. So Dr. Miranda Jones 
is being transported by the Enterprise along with Lee Marvick and along with a Medusa named Kolos. And she is a human doctor who was born a telepath. Interesting, right? Okay, so now, now we kind of see where Dr. Pulaski gets this kind of joy in meeting a true telepath because her other potential, her other potential grandmother is Dr. Jones. Not only is Dr. Jones a doctor, same as Dr. Mohol, but she's a telepath and that's why she's overjoyed. That's why Dr. Pulaski is overjoyed to meet another telepath because it's reminding her of her other grandmother. But there's more to this story than just that. Because it's so ugly or so beautiful to bear, you cannot, humans, most humans, can't look at Medusans even with a visor on. Dr. Jones being the exception, because, because she was born a telepath, she had to study mental disciplines with the Vulcans. And here's that same smirk on her face as Dr. Pulaski. So, and she's also, here Miranda Jones is wearing the visor because Spock and her are escorting the Medusan to his quarters and they have to wear the visor and the humans are all in their quarters, they're all packed away outside of the, uh, you know, outside of the uh, travel way uh, to where they go from the transporter room to Colos's quarters. And so we get to know Dr. Jones a little bit as well. Not only is she a doctor, human, and a telepath, she's a psychiatrist which is interesting because we learn that A, she's jealous of Spock. She's jealous of Spock because Spock was offered the position before she was offered the position. And she doesn't like that idea. Spock turns it down because he likes his duties on the Enterprise. But just the fact that he got offered the position to mind link with Colos first it just bothers her. She she just doesn't like it. And the reason they're going to link together and the reason Marvik is on the ship is because the Medusans have this ability to navigate that the Federation currently lacks. So she's jealous. Okay. Well, we also learn that she doesn't like the human emotion of pity. And she tells Kirk that that's the worst of all, that, that human emotion, that pity, which is strange because she's a psychiatrist. She shouldn't hate any emotion. Emotions have no weight by themselves. It's what you do with the emotion that makes them good or bad, but she hates pity. And the reason she hates pity is because, and this is where Dr. McCoy outs her because they're in a crisis situation, She's blind. She's blind, and the only way that she can see is because she has a sensor net woven into the fabric of her clothing. And she literally can judge distances more accurately with her sensor net than Kirk's eyes. She says that. Can you judge distances this accurately? Can you do these things with your eyes that I can do uh, more accurately with my sensor net? She can play tennis with Captain Kirk. She can potentially even beat Captain Kirk using the sensor net that she's wearing in her clothing. She can judge distances. She can tell his heartbeat. 
So this sensor net is extremely sophisticated. Not only is it extremely sophisticated, but it's so well camouflaged that nobody in decades has recognized that she's not blind, that she's blind. She's hidden her blindness so well using this sensor data, sensor net, that people don't even recognize it. McCoy recognizes it because he's a trained physician. He notices something is off. And this is, some, this is something to the credit of McCoy in many episodes. He notices things in, a, in the medical field that are off and that nobody else notices. I gotta, get, I gotta give them credit for McCoy's writing. So he notices that there's something off about her. He finally figures out that she's blind. And they're in a crisis situation because of Lee Marvick. The reason they're in a crisis situation is because is of Lee, because of Lee Marvick is because they are lost in space. And there's no B-9 robot to say, danger, danger, Will Robinson. So they're lost. But again, the Medusans have a way to navigate that the Federation currently doesn't. That's the whole point of them getting an engineer involved, getting um, somebody to mind link with Kolos is because they can navigate. Well, Miranda can't do it because she's blind. Spock has to do it. Spock has to be the one to save the ship. And Marvik, who at the time, Scotty doesn't know it, has gone, has gone insane because he's, he's tried to kill Kolos with a phaser, but he, of course, looked at Kolos, and he's insane. Not only is he insane, but he's madly, madly in love with Dr. Jones. Dr. Jones doesn't want any part of it. She's like, I don't want to know that part, Larry. I'm here to work with you, and that's it. This is a professional relationship. I don't want to have anything at all to do with your feelings of love towards me. Uh, you're, you're simping for me. It's disgusting. So she has all these negative feelings, right? She has all these negative emotions, Dr. Jones does. And... As a result, Lee Marvick acts out, goes insane, gets the ship into trouble, gets it into this region of space where they can't navigate out without Collis' help. Spock has to be the one who can navigate the ship because he has the experience and he can see what he's doing. Uh, however, what happens is after the mind link and after they've successfully navigated back into normal space, he forgets to put on the visor. Kirk accuses Miranda of, of actually doing that, making him forget to put on the visor, and now Spock's insane. And because of that, Kirk goes off on her. He's He goes into sickbay and He's like, I'm going to show you such ugliness with my words that, that Spock saw that you're going to see with my words what he saw, how ugly it is, and how ugly you are on the inside. You're prejudiced, your lack of empathy, you, all your negative emotions, and your negative emotions are going to be the downfall of you you're not going to be able to uh, mind link with Kalos because of it. And so his words convince her that she has to change her ways. She, she loses some of her negative attitudes. And the episode ends with Spock saving the ship, Miranda saving Spock, Miranda mind linking with Kalos, and Kirk giving her a rose. 
uh, to remind her of the eventful trip that, the, that she's had on the Enterprise. So all is well and good, but Dr. Miranda Jones being blind, not liking the fact that she's blind, not liking engineers, and potentially being the other grandmother of Dr. Pulaski is where this idea comes from that Dr. Pulaski doesn't like Jordy. She doesn't like him. So, just to put icing on the cake, photograph Jones, photograph Pulaski, you know I was going to do it. Now photograph together. <laughs> Again, just because she's 50, just because one is in their 30s and the other's in their 50s, they, they look identical. Are you blind, Kurt? Can you not see these are the two, that these two are the same? Um, and if you're not getting that reference, it's Conscience of the King, where Kirk does the whole photograph thing. Um, and that's my little pet theory. Thanks to Steve Shives. Obviously, it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek. The idea that they all look the same is because Diana Moldauer played the same character in all three, or played all three characters. Um, I do like the idea that they can be linked together in this way. That Dr. Pulaski's attitudes can come from the two other characters that she played if they're her grandmother. I just think it's a little, I just think it's funny that, that we can make these connections. Um, clearly, I'm not being that serious. Um, and Diana Moldauer, she's 84 years old, as far as I know. Um, and she's a wonderful actress. And she's incredibly beautiful. And if she ever, if she sees it or her family sees it, this is a bit of a loving tribute to to her characters in Star Trek. And now, for a little bit of bonus content, John DeMarco. I know you're going to see this, so this is kind of especially for you, Doctor Anne Mulhall is not in one episode of Star Trek. She's in at least two because she appears in the animated series episode, The Survivor. And this is Anne Mulhall in animated form. And I mean, my God, Cheekbones. The cheekbones give it away. So there you go. If you do like my content, please hit that thumbs up button. Please subscribe to the channel. Please leave a comment down below. And thank you for watching. Images are courtesy of trekcore.com. And Everybody, just have a great day. It's snowing right now where I am. It's coming down pretty hard. So I just hope that this has brightened your day a little bit. Thank you very much.